courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames ping pong of win one, lose one continues, but this week the Flames managed to somehow score 25 goals in five games. Matt, when was the last time you saw the Flames scoring like this in a week? Well, it, last year they could have done stuff like this, but uh, it definitely has been missing this year. It's almost like the Flames looked at the calendar and said, oh, playoffs are coming. All right, let's get out there and actually start playing hockey, guys. Yeah, well, even with everything that's gone wrong this season for the Calgary Flames, they find themselves two points out of first place in the Pacific Division, which, you know, yeah, this season is just bonkers. Before we actually get into the games, though, I mean, a a week like this shows you this is a good team when they want to be. Like, when these guys want to play hockey and look like a good hockey team, they're showing us they can do it. Well, and that's, like, last week to carry on the discussion that we had. Like, this is why, like, I optimistically could see this team going into the playoffs and playing well and possibly going on a bit of a deep run just because none of the teams in our division are very good. The unfortunate thing is is that there's still no consistency with this team, and even though the offense has come alive, the two games that they lost they gave up 13 goals in the two games and that obviously is not ideal <laughs> yeah it's it's weird like they either won by a large margin or lost by a large margin there wasn't like a one nothing loss well on calgary puck i heard somebody say that like the last six games it's been like tennis matches where you know in straight sets six three six two you know like that kind of thing and it's just yeah, it, very odd scores for the Flames lately, but it's good to see that the team is getting offense from most players. And interestingly, in the last, like, I think it was 13 games, Gaudreau and Monaghan have only scored three goals, and Monaghan scored one in today's game, the last goal for with a goalie in that anyway. Uh, but, yeah, it's interesting that with the 25 goals, only... A couple of them have been from the guys that you'd expect to be getting goals from, and everybody else seems to be kicking in. Well, let's talk about that. I'd say this is the week of the depth scoring. If we go all the way back to the Calgary Flames playing in the SAP Center in San Jose, uh, the Calgary Flames ended up beating the Sharks 6-2. And like you said, goals from guys we wouldn't expect. We got goals from Lucic, Reeder, Ronaldo, Jankowski, Kachuk and Backlund. So, I mean, Kachuk... Well, that, those to... first four guys, that's exactly who you draw up the game plan around scoring, you know? Those four guys? That's automatic. why you keep Reader in the lineup. <laughs> and that's, yeah. why, that's why Ronaldo's here, because he can score the goals. Yeah, well, I saw one metric that uh, Ronaldo's actually, for ice time, is one of the top ten scorers in the entire NHL. So, you know, he's awesome, clearly. What surprised me was this is his third goal of the year. Well, Ronaldo, he's a weird player in that if you give him the right shots in the right areas, he can actually score goals. It's just that seldom does he actually find himself in those correct positions. And, you know, if you give him a shot, though, he can put it in. Yeah, and and he's played, I mean, a few of these games this week where he's looked decent, he's uh, been with some different line mates, too. I mean, yeah. one of his goals this week, he was with, I don't know if it was that one, he was with uh, Janko or with uh, Goudreau and Monaghan at the time. Yeah, that was the that one yeah, in this so, game. Yeah, so, like, you know, you you better score if you're with those two guys. Yeah. Um, well, anything you want to talk about with this game? I mean, I think it was... I don't. I think we expected a win. You kind of have to win against San Jose, especially when San Jose beat you last time. And we had the big win against Vancouver. We were hoping they could translate it, um, and they did. And um, you know, I don't know what you thought, but I was. I thought we'd get a win. in In my heart, I thought we'd get a win, but I didn't expect it to be this high. Yeah. Well, San Jose is kind of bad, and uh, like everything has kind of gone wrong for them this season with injuries and. Yeah, like it, it. I was expecting them to be more like fighting with us for the division this year again, just like we were last year. And when you have all of your good players pretty much get hurt, 
you know. But the I mean, a week off. before this, it was a three-one San Jose win in the in the Sal Dome. Oh, I know. Frankly, they shouldn't have lost the last game either to San Jose. So, like, they they really didn't show up at all in that game. So, you know, the fact that the Flames actually showed up in this one, they were able to just walk all over the Sharks and it. Yeah, this is what I was more expecting. And frankly, Calgary, against the lousy teams like San Jose, Anaheim, Chicago, and L.A., they should be running up the score and putting a lot of goals in the net, which they did. You know, they didn't obviously win all of the games, but, you know, you, these teams are bad, and, like, they don't have very good defense, and they don't have good goaltending. So the Flames should be able to exert a lot of offense on them and put in a lot of pucks and they did do that this week it's just some of the games they didn't show up for either i think you're probably alluding to the next one uh two days later yep. <laughs> the calgary flames went to la to play in la against the kings ended up losing five to three in this game I'm not going to go as far as saying the Flames didn't show up. I thought we've seen some lousy efforts this year where the Flames didn't show up. I thought they played okay in this one, but it wasn't a complete game on both sides of the ice. Yeah. Uh, frankly, I, they had, like, I thought they like had pretty the, good offense, but I thought they were lousy on the on the back check, and I thought they were lousy on in their own end. Yeah, like that – when Backlund finally – broke like I thought the first period was relatively even I thought that Calgary was a little sluggish but not overly bad but then like when we got the lucky bounce and Backlund scored it was like okay well maybe we're gonna just you know take the game over and then within like a minute and a half it's they gave it you know two goals up on just two brutal defensive plays and then they gave up an early goal in the third, bounced back to get it within one, and like they were, they just couldn't turn the puck in again. And the fact yeah, that Calgary just, kept it close, I think, says something about them as well. Like we've seen games where they've gotten down and they've just stopped carrying. Yeah, and like they did fight. Like in the third period, they were pushing, and it was unfortunate that Carter scored because uh, Lindholm scored scored like right after that but it you know it's just like they shouldn't have got themselves in the spot where they needed to come back like the, I felt that like through the first 40 minutes like other than those couple of defensive lapses I thought the Flames were the better team and then in the third period they get hit again with the third goal and then they took over the rest of the period and they still just couldn't get one past Peterson or enough past Peterson to get the win. It's just a frustrating game because, like, they they really should have won that game if they had played even coherent defensively. Well, that's why, like I said, I don't think it's the worst game we've seen or near the worst no. game we've seen with this team. It was okay, but they just – there was a lot of issues in their game. And I think the fact it was, you know, 5-3 to three says a lot about the Flames' pushback in this one. Yeah, um, I don't even think the five three is necessarily indicative of L.A. playing that much better. I think the Flames. No, they they just capitalized pretty much on every chance they got, more or less. Yeah, and, like, and I think it, the Flames made some dumb moves in their own end too. That probably gave L.A. some better shots than they should have should have had. Yeah, exactly. Like it was a very poor. You know, it's like uh, when are Hamannick and Giordano coming back? Uh, anybody, please. You know. <laughs> help <laughs> well yeah the, not not the best defensive effort the next night however the flames went to the honda center the rink that we know they've been cursed at over the years put uh cam talbot in net and for once the stars aligned in the honda center the flames win six nothing to get talbot his uh first shutout as a flame we got six goals in this one four in the first we had lindholm backland shillington and jankowski score Backlund scored again in the second, and Janko in the third, and I was really hoping for a, a Jankowski hat trick in this one. Same here. Um, this was the first time that the Calgary Flames have won more than one game in a season in Anaheim since the Ducks' inaugural 93-94 season. 
Yeah. Wow. That's not good. <laughs> I mean, that first since period has by to the be way, the most uh, since, pr- productive period yes. they've ever played there. Yeah. Well, they, they've never scored more than five goals in Anaheim, so that was the highest offensive output they've ever done in Anaheim, period. I, I was going to say, I can't um, remember them ever scoring more than one or two there. Yeah. This, by the way, was only the fifth time since the year 2000 that the Flames have won in Anaheim. Five times in 20 years. <laughs> and not just a and win. two of like, them were this year. Th- <laughs> two this of them was, were this year. <laughs> this is one of those NHL blowouts, which you don't see very often. You don't see a lot of 6 yeah. nothing games in this league. No. And frankly, Anaheim is a bad team. And the Flames did what they should do to bad teams. Like, if they're playing correctly. And, uh, by the way, I'm glad to see that Jankowski... Uh, like earlier, just before he scored in that Ottawa game last month, I think it was in the show prior to that, that I said if he actually gets one, he'll go on a run. And in the uh, seven games after he scored a goal, he's now up to five. So he's, you know, he, he just seems to be getting things going right for him. And sometimes you just need that monkey off the back and then things start going back to normal. Yeah, and, and I mean, at this rate, this I, I, I wouldn't even be. Go ahead. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he hits double digits at this rate if he keeps it up. Yeah, I mean, he he was having a tough stretch at the beginning. So was everybody. But he's, you know, there's even times you and I talked about should he be sent to Stockton? Should they, you know, move him down there and get his confidence up? And whether it was in Stockton or here, I guess it was just you know he needed some time to work through whatever he's working through and. You know, we're not expecting this guy to be a top scorer on the team, but to see him get two goals in one night and a couple this week, this is the kind of depth scoring you need from him. Yeah, well, frankly, like, you need from him being either a third or fourth line center, you need, like, 10 to 15 goals from him over the course of a season just because, you know, like, in order for him to be an adequately good player at the NHL level, he needs to chip in something. And, like... He looked lost, basically, until the new year. And, uh, you know, I think we were both going, like, is he Joel Colborn 2.0, where he just vanishes into nothingness. And, you know, like, I wasn't even sure at the, you know, if he was going to be worthy of even filing a qualifying offer for, frankly. And just letting him walk at the end of the season and uh, you know now he's looking more like himself and you know i wouldn't be i wouldn't really mind at this point like if he can keep playing like this the rest of the season and for him to be back for a few seasons it's just hopefully whatever funk he was in is gone and you know just a random aberration sort of like tobias reader's season last year with the oilers if you look at mark's uh, career record in Let's start at 2017-2018 when he actually played full-time. He had 17 goals, 8 assists for 25 points. Last year, he had, he played 79 games, had 14 goals, 18 assists for 32 points. This year, he's got 47 games played, 5 goals, 2 assists for 7 points. So he's probably not going to get to the 32 or even 25 marker. But you know what? Everyone has ups and downs seasons. And I think, like you said, if we can get him to double digits, I think we're probably getting the most out of him considering where we're at right now yeah well everybody's offensive totals are down significantly pretty much halved at this point because calgary was such an offensive dynamo last year that like now this year it's been up until this past week it's been very few and far between with the goals and you know the Flames were, at, like, at this point last week, down near with Anaheim and San Jose, near the bottom of the Western standings and goals, and now they're seventh in the West just from one week. So, and, like, they're only, I think, nine or ten goals out from being in the top three. So, you know, after all of, yeah, they're 12 goals from uh, second in the West in goals. So, like, you know, after struggling all season with scoring, you know, one good week puts them pretty much right in the thick of things back near the top of the offensive categories. 
to be again. to be fair to the Ducks in this one, there were some impressive saves that Cam Talbot made here. I mean, you know, it's not like the Ducks didn't do anything. They got more shots on goal than we did. They got 44 shots, and Cam Talbot definitely had to work for his shutout here. And not saying they're going to do this, especially after this week, but if you were looking to potentially have moved Talbot, I think that's the showcase game to do it. Yeah. Well, also, that was the single most saves in a shutout for any Calgary Flame goaltender. Uh, Dan Bouchard uh, had two slightly higher save totals when the Flames were in Atlanta. But, uh, yeah, no, it was an excellent performance. And, by the way, this is part of the reason why I'm not a fan of Corsi, just for note, is that, like, when teams are down, they tend to take shots from everywhere. And so... You're, you get lopsided uh, shot totals like this one where the Ducks had 44 shots, but they certainly didn't have a, a huge amount of high-quality scoring chances. So the Flames ended their California swing to come back to the Chicago Blackhawks here, Hockey Night in Canada. And as we talked about at the beginning of the show... If they're not winning big this week, they're losing big this week. 12 goals scored in this game, 8-4 for the Blackhawks. The Flames got a pair from Bennett and a pair from Lindholm. So Lindholm, a guy we expect to be on the score sheet. Bennett, again, good to see him up there with his 6th and 7th. Um, this this seemed to me like a very typical Calgary Flames coming off the road, never seemed to do well at home. I didn't really know what to make of this one. I didn't think... Like I said, I thought the L.A. game, they didn't look really bad. I can't say they looked really bad here. They obviously got four goals, but I, I don't know. I, I thought this was, based on what we've seen all week, I thought this was a... Th- this was not a good showing for a Flames team that's showing they can rally back for a playoff spot. Yeah, like, the, um, that second period was just murder was. for the Flames. And they took their foot off like, the gas I and did- Chicago capitalized. Yeah, like, if you look at the goals that were scored, like, it's one of those rare occasions where the goalies, the goalies give up eight goals, and I can't really fault them other than on the last one, maybe. You know, like, it, it's... Yeah, it, the defense was bad, and... You know, like, it was 2-2 after one, and, you know, the Flames were playing well enough where it should be have been 2-2 after one, but yeah, the wheels kind of fell off the wagon in the second with four goals surrendered, and there's not really much you can do. Like, they, the Blackhawks scored two quick ones. We brought it to within one. Looked like we're going to push for the equalizer before the intermission, and then they scored two more quick ones. And it's by that time, it's like, yeah, game's over. Um, yeah, after the Bennett goal, I do. thought the Flames could get this back. I mean, it was 2-2 at that point. You know, and then, like you said, the Lindholm goal in the second when it was 4-3 Calgary. I thought, okay, these guys have a chance to get this back if they sort of regroup, figure out what they've done wrong, and come back out there. And I wish the Lindholm goal was close to the end of the period because I think they needed that break to do all those things. But... Yeah, you're right. As soon as Debrinket got his 14th and Nylander got his 8th and made it 6-4, I mean the game, or 6-3, sorry. Yeah, it's It done. was done at that point. And then we saw Lindholm get the 4th, you know, the 4-6 four, the four, goal to give Calgary 4. And I thought, you know what, the way they played, they're not coming back. Yeah. And it's for, you know, there are games like that where you're, you're just going, uh, guys, you know, you realize that, if you had won this game, you'd be in first place now in the division. Like, you know, you couldn't play a little better defensively. Like, it, yeah, like, it's just... you. Like, this is why, to me, like, having a good start to the season is always vital. Because games like this happen where just, like, basically everything went wrong in the, that second period. And... You know, you lose a game that, frankly, you should have won. Like, it's just frustrating because, like, if the Flames had banked a few more points earlier in the season, then a game like this happens, you're like, yeah, oh, well, who cares? And you move on. And You're in must-win like, mode directly. right now. Yeah, and it's frustrating because, like, the Flames have been in 
a weird situation where, like, despite everything being kind of bad thus far this season, like, they're still right there. And it's like, okay, guys, you know, you gotta now play ga the games the right way. Like, you can actually win the division still, with, and not, like, if you win, like, all the rest of the games, you can win the division. Like, you just have to... You're two points back. Like, it's not a big deal. And, like, games like this game against Chicago and the game against L.A., like, they... You can't do that anymore. And, like, especially, especially against, frankly, loser teams like those guys are. Like, they're not any dreams of making the postseason this year. And, like, that's, I think, the fifth time that the Flames have lost to Chicago and L.A. this season. Like, they're not good teams. And, you know, even if you win two or three of those games... You know, like, you're talking about being first in the division with a little bit of a buffer just by winning a couple of them and, instead of losing them all. And it's just, yeah. We can't Very we can't go back and change the past, but the thing I'm, I'm proud of this team for in both the L.A. game and the Chicago game is they were able to bounce back with a big win the next game. And they haven't let those yeah. become losing streaks, which I think we've seen this season where the team will lose one and then they get down and they lose another one lose another one and they get themselves in a hole and like you said you know for better or for worse you're gonna lose games nobody's gonna go you know two months undefeated well Matt as we talked about the Flames did answer back in this one and it was a big win for the Flames in a 2 p.m. start here in Calgary the Flames wore their retro whites I guess the Anaheim Ducks wore their what I would say is my least favorite Ducks jersey ever this stupid orange third jersey they've got and game that the Flames, you could probably say at times, shouldn't have maybe won, but ended up with a win in. And let's uh, recap this one for everybody. Andrew Mangiapane gets his first NHL hat trick in this game. It was Adam Henrique opening the scoring for the Ducks. Not until the second period, though, when, Hen when Henrique scores. Then Mangiapane answers back. Silverberg answers back for the Ducks to make it 2-1. Uh... The Ducks then get a third period goal, and after that, you're looking at three to one. And I don't know about you. At that point, I thought, you know what? Eh, maybe they can get this back, but there's just not enough time. And all of a sudden, Monjapani turns on the beast mode. It's Monjapani's twelfth. Then Bennett gets his eighth. Then Kachuk gets his twentieth. Monahan gets his eighteenth, and of course, Monjapani's got to get his thirteenth. Uh, Nineteen oh three in the third, and Devin Shore pots the last goal of the game, but. A game I would say the Flames probably didn't deserve to win 6-4 to four in. What were your thoughts on this one? Well, Manchapani, he didn't enter beast mode. He entered yeast mode. And then he rose to the occasion and is now the toast of the town. Any other bread jokes he got, Matt? Uh, no, no not, not right now. <laughs> I do, do you to, think though. that the Come Ducks on. now feel like they had sourdough? Probably. <laughs> Um, not that the Flames played a bad game in this one. I just didn't think that the Flames deserved a 6-4 win. I thought they deserved the win, but I don't think they deserved... I don't think they deserved six goals for, and I don't think they deserved four goals against either. Yeah, like if you have the score and made it 3-2, that would have made sense for both the quality of chances for both sides. And it's not that, like, the goalies did bad. It's just... Yeah, like it... It seemed like everything was going in at points in the game, and it's yeah, it was just a very weird game. Calgary got 43 shots on in this game, and I think that's a big part of their success. As you said earlier, when teams are down, they tend to shoot more, and they don't always shoot from optimal spots, and I thought that was a lot of Calgary's game tonight. They were just putting more rubber on the net, and I think they were able to capitalize on it more than the Ducks did. Yeah, and... and you know, to their credit, they were able to get some goals past Miller. And I thought Miller played rather well up until the wheels kind of fell off in the third period. But, yeah, it it, it's a, it was just a weird game, frankly. And, you know, that's typical of afternoon games in Calgary. Like, it's, yeah, I always hate afternoon yeah. games. Yeah, I'm just... There, there. Very seldom do you have a game, an afternoon game that goes normally from start to finish. Like it's always some weirdness 
one way or the other. I'm going through the goals here in my head and watching the replay at the same time, and I think I would sum this up as Calgary made the most of their offensive zone chances. I don't yeah, think they. I, I don't think they necessarily had the better shots. I don't think they played that much of a better game, but I think they were putting their shots on net. They were keeping the puck in the offensive zone a little bit better. Um, and just, yeah, I think making better use of their offensive chance. Not always the first chance, but making better use of those chances overall. Yeah. And I want to talk about Sam Bennett sure. for a minute. And, you know, he has struggled mightily this season. What flame has And Yeah, but especially with him, like, being perennially the guy that looks to break out and all of that. And it's so frustrating seeing him play because there he's been playing a lot better recently and scored a lot of goals this week and if he can start you you know getting confidence in himself and his abilities he can be a 20 plus goal scorer like he does have that talent in him it's just for whatever reason, he seems to get down on himself and gets in his way a bit, and and we see that like when he takes get things start going wrong and he starts taking penalties, and like I'm just hoping that like with this hot streak that he's on, that he can harness the positivity that he's doing from that and go on a extended roll with it, because. Like, there's no reason why he can't be a top six forward in the NHL. And, like, if I was looking as a, another team, like, Bennett would be, like, one of the top two or three guys in the NHL that I'd be looking at as a breakout candidate. And he's... He has all the skill. Like, there was a reason why he was drafted fourth overall. It's just that he needs to harness the positivity and whatever you know he just seems to get down on himself when things aren't going precisely his way and if he can start doing things as he has been and get a few games going together like he has and just keep it up where he's doing the right things and taking good shots you know like he could break out. It's just, well, and we say know, this about Bennett that... every year. He could break out, and I guess the question becomes: How long do you give him to have that breakout season? He's in year one of a two-year deal. Um, he's never got more than eighteen goals in a year. I mean, you know, you could say that Reader could break out, or you know, Buddy Robinson could. But I think at some point you've got to say, you know what? We've given this guy the rope, and it hasn't happened. And if it hasn't happened by when do we say it's not going to happen? I would say you give him till the end of this contract. I don't know that. I mean, he's got a slight increase in pay every year. I don't know that you bring him back at two point five million when he's twenty five. He hasn't broken out yet. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know I what you think. That. I just think if he's, you know, he's twenty three right now, so he's on his twenty three year year. Next year will be his twenty four year old year. If he's 25 and he still hasn't broken out, I think he becomes a perennial middle middle six NHLer. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Like it, you know, you're looking at basically more or less like a Rafi Torres type guy. And like you said, a lot of GMs you know. probably would think there's some uh, some upside there, and I could see him because of that jumping around the league on a lot of one or two year deals. Of okay, let's. Go to Chicago, didn't work out there. Let's go to Toronto, like, you know, wherever it might be. I think there's a lot of GMs that would probably keep bringing him back because he's good enough. And I think he could have a long career in the league because he's good enough. Yeah, uh, just, uh, you know, like, uh, I like Sam Bennett. Like, I, especially during the playoffs, like, he's always, like, one of the Flames' best players during the playoffs. And... Uh, like I just like uh, when he's elevating his game, he can be a very key contributor for this team. It's just that for whatever reason he can't find any consistency in the regular season, and I'm hoping that with this little hot streak that he's on, he can go on a more of an extended run and maybe get into you know some 
more offensive chances and maybe getting played further up the lineup instead of relegated to the third or well, fourth Well, like you said, because of his playoff prowess, I could also see this guy be a guy who gets moved a lot in his career the deadline of teams saying, yeah, let's bring him in now. We don't want to pay him all year for his playoff performance. But, you know, I can see this being a guy who gets moved for a third or a fourth every year, every couple of years. And we see players like that who, you know, they're the depth pieces the teams want to load up on for the playoffs. I'm not giving up on him. I'm just trying to be realistic. He's making 2.5 right now. And I think if he's, you know, an 18 goal scorer or at most a 30 point scorer, I'm not sure when we start diluting the talent pool in two years with, you know, 25 new NHLers. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Bennett will still be around because of that because there's going to be more guys that need jobs when Seattle comes in. But I don't think that you see teams paying him a lot more than he is now if he can't get those numbers up. Yeah, I can agree with that. You know, that. I could even see a team like Chicago taking a swing at a guy like Bennett, overpaying him in his first couple years and give him a three-, four-year deal at $2 million just because, like you said, he's a solid NHLer who has some potential there. Yeah. Um, but yep. yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. The Flames do have RFA rights to him. I can see this being a piece that gets moved next year at the trade deadline. Yeah, I can see that. Well, too. With that, in- it just uh, it depends on lots of factors. But I'm hoping that he breaks out because you know a lot of Flames fans really do like Sam Bennett and you know what are cheering for him and want him to be successful here especially because he does step it up in the playoffs and you know you want guys like that to be you know like if you're wanting the flames to win the stanley cup like he's one of those guys that you'd like to see be successful with the team and like especially because we drafted him and all that and you know i'd just like to see him manifest the potential that he had when we drafted him and I also all that think that stuff. Bennett has maybe stayed in the lineup as long as he has the flame because there weren't a lot of better options but I think that with Dubé with Mangiapane it might make it an easier decision for the team to say you know what we got two guys there and Bennett who all are probably vying for a top six spot they can't all be in the top six, so it might be an easier thing to say, you know what, maybe let's look at what Bennett could bring us as currency. Yeah. And another thing to note that Manjapane is actually younger than or older than Sam Bennett, so just to give some reference to like relative ages, like, you know, even though he breads in his first full full season with the team yeah so Mangiapane and yeah. Bennett are both in their 20 are both 23 um yeah. but yeah I mean Mangiapane has we you know we could talk about who they've played with a lot of things could go into that but uh Mangiapane being a sixth round pick and Bennett being a first round pick and you know what I mean there's a lot of first round picks out there I don't want to say they're bust but just don't become the the top sniper on the team or the top player on the team and you know, I, I think, like I said, Bennett's got a, a long NHL career. I just don't know if keeping him around because we like him is the best asset management for him. Oh. Well, Matt, with that, if we take a look, as you mentioned earlier, at where the Flames now sit in the Western Conference, they are two points out of the Pacific Division lead, which is held by Edmonton. Still weird for me to say. Uh, Edmonton's at 70 points. Calgary's at 68. So Edmonton, Vegas, both at 70. Vancouver, 69, is the number three team in the Pacific. Calgary's at 68. Arizona's at 68. Nashville's at 65. So while we probably wish they would have won one or two games you know, this week, We've got Boston, we've got Detroit before the trade deadline. Um, probably very good possibility the Flames stay in this this race and potentially overtake Vancouver. Looking ahead beyond uh, this week to the trade de- past the trade deadline, all the way through the middle of March. Uh, if you go all the way to the March 18th, um, the Flames actually are playing virtually every game except for one game against New Jersey and the one game against Detroit are against teams that are either in the playoffs or are vying for the postseason and you know like in ninth or 10th like they're really right there alongside and that 
this was why like this past like eight games was so vital for the Flames to go on a tear and they did win four of the eight which that's adequate but you know they really did need to win more than that and they needed six at least and like now you're going into a stretch of games where like most of the teams are fairly good and like the flames are going to have to earn the points moving forward they set themselves in a good yeah, position right in those games though yeah, but, you know, like, this is where, like, they really needed to be better throughout the last eight games, and heading into, like, all the way to the 21st of March, like, it, there's only two easy games out of the next, like, 11, 12 games, so Calgary needs to be ready to go pretty much from puck drop each game, and they're not going to have any easy opponents now in the next 15, and... It's frustrating because, you know, like, it, the Flames needed to, like, they don't have much of a uphill climb to get into first in the, co or our division, but, you know, it would have been a lot easier had they banked some more points against But again, could have, would have, should have, right? We got to look ahead now, not back. We are where we are, and we... True. I mean, the the Flames are probably doing the same, right? You could go back and say we should have won that one, should have won that one. We didn't, so we've got to play the hand that we're dealt going forward. Um, I think, to me, the biggest promising thing that we saw this week was not that we can score six goals, that we got depth scoring. You know, you talked about Bennett getting going. Uh, we saw Jankowski getting going. We saw Ronaldo chipping in. I think if you're going to beat some of these teams and show you can play against playoff teams, it can't be Johnny, Monty, Lindholm, Kachuk scoring, you know, six, eight goals a night. You need those those depth guys chipping in. And, and I think that's, that's what's going to tell us if the Flames can win these next few games or not is if the depth scoring can continue. Yeah, and, like, that's part of what made the Flames team so dangerous last year. Is Goals that came everywhere. Basically everybody, yeah, basically everybody on the team was doing adequate or better throughout the lineup, and, like, not so much this season. And thankfully, uh, with Eat Bread playing well and uh, Dubé playing well and Sam Bennett playing bel well recently, even Jankowski, it helps, and... Like, those guys need to continue playing like that if the Flames want to make the playoffs. And, you know, hopefully guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan actually show up and contribute some offense themselves instead of, like, three goals in 14 games. But, you know, that, we'll see how that well, goes. Well, and, you know, you said earlier, Jankowski, for whatever reason, struggled early. And, you know, now he's coming alive and we're hoping uh, he can go on a bit of a streak. I think we're seeing that with Bennett as well. And for whatever reason, if, you know, Goudreau's not coming alive, well, hopefully some of these guys can augment that scoring until he does, you know. And whether that's by committee or one guy like a Mangiapane or a, a Bennett starts scoring a lot of goals... I think there's enough scoring talent. They've proven now they can do it. I'm not expecting a you know six nothing win over Boston, but we've proved that these guys can no. play a good game and get a win. And I think you're going to see lower scoring games, but they need they need to keep playing the way they've been playing when they've been winning. Yeah. And you know even if the games are much lower scoring in that case. Um, there still needs to be shots from everywhere. Every line needs to contribute somehow. You know, even if we find one or two lines scoring, be those the top two, the bottom two, whatever, we need to be ready for everybody to be in that position to score and contribute offensively, to put pucks on net, to, you know, jam them in front. And that's how you're going to have success. And the best teams in the league, that's what we're seeing. Yeah. And one thing uh, that's noteworthy is that this team has changed their offensive style uh, the last six, seven games, where, by and large, they've been, instead of chipping and chasing, they've been carrying the puck through the neutral zone and being that transition team that we saw in the early part of last season. And hopefully that can continue as well, because I think that plays more to the Flames' strengths 
as an organization because they don't really have the speed to play the chip and chase to style me the chip of game. and chase style has always um, looked like a team that was not offensively confident for for any team yeah. even if you have speed it it's is. like let's chip it in let's go get this thing let's kind of hope we can set up i think when you can move it on your own past the blue line you look whether you are or not you look more offensively confident and you give yourself the chance to set up how you want to otherwise it kind of seems sometimes like oh hey we chipped it in and we you know managed to get ourselves in and hey look we got a goal if that makes sense instead of like we're coming in we know what we're doing let's put this on net and you know good luck trying to stop us yeah and like the way i always look at like uh, at things like I don't like seeing teams giving up possession without a battle and like when you chip it in you're in effect making it a 50 50 split where you'll get the puck back or not and you know like and that's just getting the puck back that's not even doing anything with it and it just seems to reduce the overall percentage that a play will actually turn into anything noteworthy and it just it seems to like make the everything harder when you do it that way and you know like it anytime like a defender approaches a forward like it's going to be a 50 50 battle but you know if you can reduce the amount of battles that you have to fight with the puck the more that you'll have a good chance of scoring the only and thing we see from the flames sometimes they the, take it in and they make too many passes and i think that's another thing this team's got to be careful of is Bring it on your own accord. Don't dump it, you know, chip it and chase it, like you were saying, or dump it and chase it. But know when it's time to get that shot off. And it's not just when they're playing this way, but so often we see the Flames make one or two too many passes, especially on the power play. Yeah, well, to me, like, on the power play, it should be, like, mo no more than, like, two or three passes before you shoot. Like, Unless, like, you're having a passing clinic where you're get you know, completely eviscerating the other team's defense and, like, just going tic-tac-toe with things. Then, and I think the sure, issue, honestly, is often that, we don't have forwards in happens. position. So they're trying to pass it, waiting for forwards to get in position. If you got one or two guys in front of the net, just put it on the net, let somebody try to jam it in. Yeah. You don't have to have a highlight reel goal all the time. You can just, you know fling it in there and hope for the best and you know they all count the same way so we talked last week and i had said on the show i don't know if you agree with this but i said last week i don't think manjapani is a top six forward yet and we had a few people on twitter uh someone who responded to our thread on calgary puck a number of people ask why not um first before i sort of you know speak for us do you feel that manjapani is a legit top six on a playoff team on a playoff team, he would be the sixth guy if you're counting it that way. Um, if your team's has no depth, then yeah, sure, maybe. But yeah, your team has no depth, and that's more the reason why I mean, he'd be there. When I look at your um, top six, obviously on this team, you've got Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, Backlund, Kachuk, and then a bunch of other guys. And I feel like... You know, Manjapani got thrown in there because he was the guy that looked the best. But when I'm looking at top six, I don't like the idea. And you mentioned earlier how much less NHL experience Manjapani has than Bennett. I just don't think he has enough experience for us to say, yes, this is our top six guy. He, he's looking good now, yeah. but he didn't and, look great last season. Yeah, it, it's... Well, it's one of those things that he... Frankly, I would not be surprised if he emerges as a good. But it's gonna top take a couple forward. years. And the, part of the problem is, is that the Flames are kind of in that weird spot where they're both trying to contend while trying to develop. And it, like, I think that Majapane will be a good middle six, maybe top six forward down the road. And, like, especially that backhand goal he scored today, like, that was top class there. But, you know, he needs to be able to do that with more 
regularity, and in order to do that, he needs to have more experience, and it's kind of like that catch-22 of he needs to do that consistently, but he'll only do that consistently if he gets the experience to do it consistently, and yeah. When, when it, I look at Manjipani... You have to kind of, you have to kind of endure that, you know, that period until he figures it out. But could he out. figure it out just as well, say, on a line with Bennett and Dubé, or, you know, somewhere else in the bottom pairing, or the bottom six? Well, for sure. And he definitely could. The problem is, is that the Flames don't have anybody else to, at the moment, organizationally to say, oh, that guy is clearly better than what Manjapane brings. And, like, if the Flames were to, say, go out tomorrow and get Kovalchuk or any of the insert miscellaneous top six right wingers here, you know, and throw them in there, then clearly, you know, he would be taking Manjapane's that not spot, good enough but... that they're not shopping for a replacement. Yeah. But... Uh, and, and, like, and how much frankly, the, like the Flames would be a, the Flames would be a vastly more dangerous team if Manjapani is on the third or fourth line. You know, if we have a legitimate option to be with, like Kachuk and Lindholm or whomever is on that line, you know, like if we have a legitimate option to go there, then this team's gonna be in a lot better position. It's just. You know, we don't have that organizationally right at the moment. We'll see, like in the next week, for sure, if anything will be done to. And how much? I'm not that. saying Manjapani doesn't look good this year, but the body of work to me doesn't tell me. As you said, he could be a top six down the road. I don't see him there yet. But I wonder how much of his performance because who he's playing with. We're seeing him playing with Goudreau, Monahan, Lindholm, Backlund, Gachuk in various iterations. I think if you put you know, Bennett, Dubé in there, they both would have had the same chance. I'm not saying they would have, but then they would have had the same chance to break out that Manjapani has. I think he's looking better because of his line mates, but I'm not convinced he's your he's your top six guy. Yeah, I can see that. It, he's How would you say, of like Bennett, and Dubé, and him... He has looked the best consistently of those three in terms of generating offense, and I think that's why he's getting the opportunity. Coming into the season, just, though, if they would have you know, asked like you, I, let's say you were you know, on the coaching staff, and they said, hey, we got these three guys, Bennett, Dubé, Manjipani, who would you put in the top six? I wouldn't put Manjipani there. I would have put Dubé in. I would have put yeah? Ypres in. So, yeah, it, 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 Dubé... Ash, I probably would have gone Bennett just because he's the older guy, and I think that's how you get him to break out. Yeah, I I think I would have went with Manjapane just due to the fact that uh, he's the fastest skater of the bunch, and that that's why you know like he's more likely to be able to create stuff on his own just because of that, and that would it would be. Well, you could easily make arguments for any of the three, though. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not like one was clearly better than the other. It was. To, I would just have gone that route, simply just due to the fact that uh, Majapane is slightly faster than both Dubé and yeah. Bennett. Yeah, he's twenty three. He's really playing his first full year in the league. I mean, you know, this is the most games he's played. He's played fifty six so far, and he has uh, twenty one points. I also don't think 21 points over 56 games makes a top six player. Now, as you mentioned, we do... No, he he would be... Like, ideally, you'd have him Mm -hmm. riding on your third line. Like, think of a guy like Connor Sheary when he was with Pittsburgh. You know, like that ideal guy who can Mm -hmm. chip in a little bit. Or like when Jake Gensel was a depth player for the Penguins. Like, just somebody who can chip in a little bit here and there and while your main guys do the bulk of the heavy lifting and like Calgary unfortunately at the moment doesn't have that other extra good better player to put on the top six at the moment and I think that the Flames like if they're more serious about trying to like be that cup contender you know and like actually go for it they need to get another top six winger 
just to be able to push everybody else down. Monji is the guy but put up there when we have injury that's gonna troubles. That's going to be easy. Yeah. But, you know. Or if he's on a hot streak, you know, you reward him with some extra ice time. But, you know, not your no, go-to guy. I think when you're, you know, if you're management, you're putting on the wall your top six or seven forwards, let's say six, and you say, okay, we want to build two really good lines. We won't debate who should be where or if there's better out there, but you look around this team, I think Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, Kachuk, those f- four guys are bona fide. Four are, yeah, yeah, those guys are reliably for sure top six guys. You can throw them in any order. Backland, and I it think. Makes sense. Yeah, like, okay, really, he's good enough to be a. He, he's a yeah. He's a like he would be the ideal sixth guy on you know like most teams don't have like a number six guy that's as good as ben, Backland. So you know I could see that working. So, so I think but, we have five bona yeah, fide top to, sixes, but, and I mean heck, you could probably have played Reader with. Backlund got Chuck and got good good work out of him too. Like, you know, we saw Ronaldo playing with yeah. Monahan Goudreau. He looked good. Like, I think you could have thrown anyone on that line besides probably Lucic and gotten as many points he got out of Manjipan. He's fast, but I just I'm I don't want to say he's top six yet until he's proven it. Like, you, as you mentioned, he very well could be. I'm just not sold on it yet. And I think if we as fans are saying we need to go out and find somebody. I think that's the the real kicker, right? We're not saying, oh, we got to find you know another defenseman. Ours are good enough. Like I think the fact that we still see that hole tells you if he was good enough, he would have filled filled it, and we'd be sitting here saying, well, the Manjapani kid came on and really looked like a, a top find. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, is that the Flames also have to be patient with him and like Dubé and all that because they are getting better like as the season's gone on all of those players have been looking increasingly good at, at various times like even Oliver Shillington on defense has looked a lot better re- more recently than he was earlier in the season it's just trying to both deal with a whole bunch of inexperienced players trying to establish themselves while simultaneously trying to be like one of the elite teams, it's hard, and like that's why a lot of teams that are like the Boston's and the Pittsburghs and that, like they usually fold guys like that in on the fourth line until they're ready to take the next step up the lineup, and you know, uh, it's just yeah, we're kind of in that we don't have the depth as good as some of the other teams do. And it's frustrating because, like, the Flames do need another And I think that forward. by putting Monjapani up there too fast, you may ask for too much and limit the production, you know? And I think that there's players like that. I think Monjapani, Ben Adube could be a great third line for this team if they were, you know, a legitimate contender. But I just, I don't want to stifle development by asking too much too early. Yeah, and, like, that's why, like, I'm very much looking forward to this team hopefully addressing getting another top six forward or two not not necessarily like for the trade deadline but like in heading into next season because it's quite clear that like they were relying on uh for leak and backland basically shoehorning them into top six roles and they need somebody to fill that it's well just, you and i've talked yeah, a lot about how the three in line the sum was greater than the parts right they look good together but should those oh, yeah, three sure. have probably all been top six? Probably not. No, like ideally, uh, for Leak and Backland are fixers on your third line. But uh, unfortunately, the Flames didn't have the depth, and that's you know it. That's part of like why the Flames are just having the fun issues that they've been having with being so up and down, and like they need to, like that's they're kind of stuck in that no man's land because like they don't re- like other than Peltier they don't really have any bona fide forward prospects coming up they don't have a ton of draft picks and they there's not really anything imminent 
yet they have the needs for getting some forwards, and it's like, well, how do you play ring around it to get what you need while not, like, completely hampering your future as well, and it an interesting We've had that discussion. We don't necessarily facing. have to have that discussion again about, you know, your ideas. So, and I'm not saying they're not good, but we've just had them enough of doing this in-place rebuild, that sort of thing. But let's talk deadline. If you think the Flames might uh, might be going out looking for a forward, we're one week from the trade deadline. I think that we're starting to see some interesting trends emerge. We saw this. We saw Jason Zucker move last week, as you and I talked about, a lot given up for him. Alex Galchenyuk, Kalen Addison, a first. We saw probably one of the most talked about Flames targets off the board now, going to Vancouver is Tyler Toffoli, and back to L.A. is Tim Schaller, Tyler Madden, a second and a conditional fourth if Toffoli signs. And then we saw the Tampa Bay Lightning acquire Blake Coleman for Nolan foot in a first and Andy Green went off to the Islanders for David Quenville in a second you've heard me say it over and over and again I won't you know go into it as as much either but this would be a great year to sell our assets if we want to sell so Matt with that in mind looking at where we are now one week away buyers or sellers or do you just stand pat with what you uh, got this this season is so frustrating because it makes a hundred percent sense for the Flames to go in all in and buy. It also makes a hundred percent sense to go all in and sell everything. It, this season is just so bizarre. Like it, with how they're playing right now, like if they can carry that forward the rest of the season and into the postseason, if they add. They could go to the conference finals because our division is terrible, and it you know, you never know what you're gonna get in the conference finals. If the other team is not very good or injured, you might end up finding yourself in the Stanley Cup finals just because our division is terrible. On the other hand, our farm system is awful. Uh, we don't really have. Anything. I wouldn't say our uh, farm system Peltier is awful. They're doing a, a good job developing guys. We've seen that Mangiapane and Dubé. There's not oh, enough yeah. no, players no, there to no, be no, developed. No, no, no. That's what I mean. Like, there's just no talent there. Like, that's upcoming. Because, like, all the main guys are already in the league. Other than a few long shot guys like I wouldn't Phillips even say long shots. And, I'd probably say uh, your Pedersen. bottom six potential. Yeah, just... Uh, like they were all late round draft picks, and it, like if they hit, Mondo that's Penny. awesome. But you're not expecting it, yeah. But you know, like the Flames don't really ha- like on defense. They have Alexander Yellison, who's in the NHL and not looking particularly awesome, and that's it. Like they don't. Valimaki's still out. They don't have anything, and on goaltending, they have a couple of ifs and maybes. They don't really have any surefire guys up front. It's very sparse. And, like, that's why, like, it makes 110% sense to sell because we have a whole bunch of very viable pieces to a bunch of teams. And there's a bunch of teams wanting to add, like, uh, with St. Louis losing Jay Bomeister. And, by the way, I hope that everything goes well with uh, the former Flame, Jay Bomeister, and his whole medical situation and hope that he can have a good quality of life moving forward. But, um, you know, like with them losing Bo Meester, they all of a sudden need a top four defenseman and the F- Blues have a lot of parts like uh, Jordan Kyrou, uh, who is actually selected with the Flames second round pick that we used to get Elliot. Uh, getting a guy like that and let's say a first for TJ Brody, that would be an awesome trade for us and would be about what we would expect in a return for that. Like, there's a lots of trades that, like, if the Flames decided to sell, like, we could restock the cupboard very quickly. It's just that, like, when you're two points out of first, that's why, like, this whole season has been so frustrating because, like... You can make clear arguments on both sides of the equation, and where do you go with it? And, 
yeah, it's frustrating. Me personally, if I was in charge, I would actually sell, even though the Flames are doing well, and just rip it. I don't and... think I would rip it, as you're saying. I mean, again, we know, you know, you've mentioned some of the way you'd rebuild internally. I don't know if now is the right time for that, but looking at the core that we have locked up for next year, you've got most of the important pieces. I think, you know, you can get Brody signed, or you can get Hamannick signed either way, but... You know, on the forward side, we really don't lose anybody big. Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, Backlund, Gachuk, Mangiapane will qualify. Lucic, Bennett, Dubé, you know, Jankowski, Reader. You can get all those guys back in the lineup. Um, your goaltender's back in Riddick. Like, I think for where they are, now if you want to do something, you sell assets you can. I think all your expiring contracts and you say, you know what, if this team is good, they'll be able to put together again next year. It's the same core. If they're not, then we got to do something in the summer if we don't think they can, but just looking at what, you know, players are going for right now, sell the UFAs. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. And like, even if there's the odd, they got piece, got like uh, a full no trade. Giordano that I know. But, you know, if you say, hey, we'll trade you to the Washington Capitals or Boston Bruins. I think you your bigger pieces like Backlund or Goudreau, you look at the draft. Those have to be hockey trades. True. I don't think you're going to see hockey trades this year. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, that's why it's so frustrating with this, because like, if they were, say, five points down or up from where they were, you would have a clear indication of what they should do. <laughs> it's just yeah it's very hard because you know like to me like uh, frankly i would sell either way um just because of the fact that you know and that that would be a very frustrating thing to do and i'm sure a lot of flames fans would be rightly annoyed but you know there's also a reason why a lot of canadian teams don't do very It'd be well different to me if this is the last year of this core or something, and you say, you know what, let's try to run with it while we've got it. You know, but all the forwards yeah. are back. Like we well, talked about Hannafin, Anderson, Stone will be back. Um, I think you can probably get Brody back if you want him. Shillington. Like, there's not a lot of pieces. Number five will be back. There's not a lot of pieces here that aren't going to be here. So if this team is truly good... They did it last year. They could, I think, you know, legitimately show they were good again next year. And with a little bit of retweaking, with a couple changes in the offseason, maybe another top six forward, why not sell, get the value, and try it again with the same core? Yeah, because, like, especially because of how, like, this team has depleted itself with trading off draft picks to get valuable pieces, mind you. But, you know, like... It, you look at, like, what the Flames gave up to get Hamannick. Well, if you could, say, get a first-round pick back for Hamannick, then, you know, you haven't really lost much of anything. If you know, Blake like, Coleman's were the trade. first, like, you got to Hamannick's use... got to be worth the first. Yeah, like, you look at Andy Green, who's 37 and not very good. He got a second and a decent prospect. Like, you know, you look at... Hamannick, like, that guy is clearly better than that. And virtually every playoff team wants more defensemen. So, you know, like, that would be, like, an ideal trade. And you'd basically recount what you spent to get him in the first place. And you got to utilize him as a good quality piece for this team for the entire duration. So, you know, you wouldn't really be out anything. And this team could you know, reuse his money next season either by attempting to bring him back or get another defenseman or spend that money on a upgrade up front or Assuming figure something this team out. Assu- thinks they're, se- they're playoff contenders, which I think they do, I don't think we're going to see them sell, even though you and I think that's the best way to go. I don't want to no. see them go out and make a massive rental deal. I think looking at the roster and the pieces we'll have to give up, I don't think you can just give up a bunch of picks again. As you mentioned, we need players in our AHL you know, system. I think you know when I'm looking at what are valuable pieces, Backlund's got a no trade. If you're looking for a rental, you're looking to give him a Bennett, a Jankowski, you know, a Shillington. 
I really think if these guys want to do something, go out and get your Oscar Fantenberg of this year to shore up defense that Yellison doesn't have to be in there. And other than that, stop. I think you've got the four depth. Yeah. We probably need another defenseman or two if we think we're going to make a long run. Davidson's not going to do it. Yellison's not going to do it. But, you know, trade your fourth for this year's version of Oscar Fantenberg and you're done. Yeah, and, like, if you can pick up a depth forward, like, a decent offensive depth forward, you know, like, I know I've mentioned Kovalchuk, but if there's even, like, a lesser version of that guy available that you can get for, like, a fourth or a guy like Ruzitska or something like that. You know, at that point, though, I'd almost rather just bring Robinson and Quine in and let them roll in that bottom six depth forward role. Yeah, well, I'm meaning, like, I'm not meaning... Like, I'm meaning, like, a middle six right winger slash center or something like that. Like, but, but again, I think with all the players or all the teams that need players, you're not going to get Kovalchuk for a fourth because I think like Toffoli, like, I think part of what happened with Coleman is they were bidding against each other. I just think that the buying's going to be so yeah, frenzied no, this agree. year that you're not getting anything at a, at a decent price. That's why I would say, you know, get one – Pick one thing. If you need to pick a forward or a defenseman, go for that thing. If someone else falls in your lap, great. But if it was me, I'd focus on the depth defenseman. Yeah. I keep con- kicking the tires each day until, you know, if something shakes out and, you know, but yeah. I mean, I, th- I think that looking at our forward group, if we had to slot Quine, Robinson, Kirkland, those kind of guys in somewhere in the middle nine. I think so, you can make it serviceable for a couple of games in the playoffs. If we've got to run Yellison in a conference final, we're in bad shape. And that's what I'm saying. I think if you're going to bring in one thing, bring in the depth D. Yeah. Well, then you'd be seeing like a Brennan Evans situation where, hey, Yellison, you're playing, but uh, for like 45 seconds. <laughs> but even then, you're putting a lot of stress in your other defensemen. Yeah. Well, you'd pretty much have to at that, that stage, unfortunately. But I mean, you'd it's go not Valimaki ideal, in the playoffs before you'd go Yellison, and even that I'm not sure is the best idea right yeah. now. I know. I have a question for you. Sure. Valimaki, does he play in Calgary from now to the end of the season? Regular season? Yeah. If Giordano and Hamannick are out long term, I think he does because he's better than Yellison. If Giordano and Hamannick are back, I think he stays in Stockton. We saw him, you know, in Stockton last year when he came back from his injury. I think he's got to go down there for conditioning. I don't want to put him in, you know, not having played all year. But, yeah, I, I think if if he's – if we have an ideal defensive lineup, I think he's better off in Stockton this year. If we're scratching our heads trying to find his number six – I think they give him a shot. I don't think yeah. they give him a shot right after he's healthy. I think you send him down for a week, get his legs under him, and then bring him back up. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, like I I know we like him. I know he's a you know top round pick. Flames fans want to see him. I'm not convinced this guy's got the durability to be in the NHL, Matt. I really am not. Yeah. He was hurt but, last year. He's hurt this year. We haven't. It's like our goaltenders. Parsons could be good. We got to see a full season out of the kid. Like. Valimaki to me is the same. Prove to me you can play a season without getting hurt. Yeah, same with Gillies and yeah. Like I, I want him to be a good NHLer, but I don't want to put our eggs in a basket that so far has shown us it's not reliable. Yeah, one guy that I definitely would like to see the Flames get, and it's unfortunate that Nashville's making a little push for the playoffs themselves, would be Cali Yarncroc. Um. He's just one of those decent middle six forwards, and he's under contract for a long time. And, you know, he's just a decent overall player. It's just unfortunate that Nashville's actually somewhat in the race still. Um, but he would be a definitely a player I'd be wanting if the Flames do decide to add. That's the kind of guy that I think you make a hockey deal for. And yeah. I just I don't know how many hockey deals are out there this year at the deadline. True. Could be wrong, but I just I don't see a lot of guys who I, I don't see a lot of teams teams that are in the playoffs aren't gonna I don't think want to make the hockey deal, you know, yeah. unless you you're like, hey, we got a D, you got a forward. 
But even then, I think with the standings as tight as they are, you'd want to do that Eastern Conference. And again, that cuts your window down. Like, I think if you're going to make a hockey deal, you're doing it in the summer. Yeah. Well, I agree. And, like, I look at, uh, like, a guy like Car- Yarncroc and... You know, like, there's a bunch of players around the league that are like that, where, like, that's why selling wouldn't be the worst idea, just because of the fact that you'd have capital at the draft. It's one of those things that, like, I'm somewhat surprised that, like, there hasn't been a general manager who hasn't decided to just sell when it's good to sell and buy when it's good to buy. And, like, if you look at, like at the trade deadline it's always the best time to sell and at the draft and that it's always the best time to buy and like i feel that like if you had somebody who is just kind of like building the team without giving any <clears throat> about anything and was just you know focused solely on like maximizing assets that you know the you could get some really good bargains out of you know just flipping guys at the deadline and then buying better like maybe like bounce back or breakout candidates like we did with Lindholm at the draft well and I mean even on that if I look at okay so we need a a right shot top six and if I'm looking at guys that'll be available this summer both have proven they can do it and might be breakout guys I would almost rather wait and shop this summer than give up something for a rental. We've got Toffoli, Sam Reinhart, Ryan Strom, John Gabriel Peugeot, Connor Brown, Evan Rodriguez, Melker Carlson, Josh Anderson, Jesper Foss, who I really like, uh, Josh Levo, Jake Vertanen, like Kevin LeBlanc. There's, you know, LeBlanc's an RFA, Strom's an RFA, Brown's an RFA, but, you know, I mean, even if we look at the UFAs in that group, um, I just I think you're better to either make your hockey deal or go shopping in the summer. Yeah, I agree. You know, I mean, if I look at that that group, um, you know, look, looking at who's available, you know, as a as a winger there, I think I still think Defoley's a target. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I would not be unhappy with. Um, I, I think Jesper Foster would be a good guy. Not maybe your top six, but another right-handed guy and a guy who could break out. Yeah. Um, I could even see this team. Not saying I want them to go that way, but I could see them making a run at JS uh, Pajot. Yeah. Like that. You know. I just think if you want to improve, like you said, sell what you can. I think this is the summer to do the improvement and run next year with the same core. I agree. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see what Tree does in the next week. It, this is like the perhaps like the single most fascinating trade deadline in modern Flames history because you know any which direction the Flames go, it makes sense. I think the worst idea that they could do is like completely standing pat because <laughs> I think that would be kind of a. You have to at least do a depth move if you're the Flames. I think right now. Yeah. What I don't, I think, I know what you're saying about anything they do could be the right move. The only thing I think they could do that would be foolish is to mortgage the future for this year. This team hasn't shown that they are, this is the year to mortgage the future. Like if you start to move, you know, Shillington or Dubé or Mangiapane for your rental, I think that's the wrong move. Yeah, I agree. You know, this is not the the year to start moving those guys for the rental. Last year, maybe because we, uh, we, you know, we we're first in the West. We all thought we had a a long playoff run in us. But you just yeah. this is not the year to blow it up at the deadline and bring and go for the run. If you're going to blow it up at the deadline, you move some UFA pieces and keep the rest and say, hey, we'll tweak in the off season. But yeah, that's like, the I only thing I could see core... Tree doing that would be wrong. Yeah, like I couldn't see any like core pieces uh, moving at all. But I mean, even if you did something like Bennett and Banco for a rental, you're still now without two, two very decent, yeah, depth guys, and like you know, and, so, and you have to go and find two new depth guys to replace them. And, and that's, that's why not I think that, easy. And that's why I just think the price of rentals right now 
I mean, I think you'd have to include Bennett and or Jankowski in any sort of a rental deal, unless you want to give up all picks. And even then we're screwed because we don't have a lot of, as you mentioned, other depth. So I think you've almost got to stand pat. Yeah. Unless you're selling. Yeah. It'll be weird, that's for sure. We'll talk next week after the trade deadline and see what the Flames did. But, Matt, before we uh, get there, we've got two games this week to look at. Yep. You and I made some predictions last week. Five games, neither of us did well. I thought we'd win against Anaheim at home and L.A. on the road. You thought we'd win at home against Anaheim and lose the others. We were right. We won against Anaheim at home, but we didn't do well predicting the rest of the week. Yeah, well... Wish it was even, we were even more wrong than we were. <laughs> Before we get to the games, um, one quick thing I want to talk about, sort of leads into predictions, is how do you use the goalies from here on out? I would say Riddick has been your better goalie recently. Or sorry, I'd say uh, Talbot has been your better goalie recently. I think you've got to run Talbot until Riddick earns the net back. Like I would say Boston, Detroit, I'd give both of them to Talbot. Well, you look at um, like uh, on uh, the game today, like they actually showed a metric of the last six starts, and like Talbot was running like a nine thirty save percentage, and uh, Riddick was in like eight fifty zone, give or take. Riddick's and, been terrible at home recently too. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, say so, terrible, but terrible comparative to his usual play. Yeah, so frankly, like I would run Talbot, frankly, until. Like, all of these games now are must-win, so you run with the best guy. And Talbot has been the best guy lately, so you run with him until he starts being bad, and then you throw Riddick back in. We have a back-to-back on the 29th of February and the 1st of uh, March. I think unless somebody looks bad, I would run Talbot right till the 29th. Give him Boston, give him Detroit, give him the other Boston, give him Nashville, give him Tampa Bay give Riddick the second half of the back-to-back, which is Florida, and then assess what you want to do after that. Yeah, I agree. So with that, uh, let's, you know, you and I would put Talbot in net, but what are your predictions for these two games this week? We've got uh, one more game at home, which is Boston on Friday after the team gets a three-day break, 7 p.m. start time. Then the Flames go on the road against Detroit on Sunday, and then it's the trade deadline, so only two games this week. Loss, loss. You think two losses? Yep. Why two losses? I think that this team won't be able to beat Boston. I think what will happen is that they're going to try their best to beat the Bruins, but Boston will just be too good for them. And then they'll get down on themselves and think, oh, well, Detroit sucks. They've only won, like, 13 games a season or something. And, yeah. It's very Calgary Flames, isn't it? Yeah, like, oh, well, we tried, and then we didn't. And I think that's how the week will go. That's really how this whole season's been, is, hey, we play against a good team, we look good, we don't quite do it, then we got a bad team, and we just stink the joint up. Yeah, Uh, you know, like, as you can tell, I have a ton of confidence in this team's abilities to, you know, play well. (laughs) If they do that, though, I think that that makes the decision to sell all that much easier for the team like if you blow those two like it you know like it's bad i know? don't think you have to win boston but i think you have to be competitive against boston yeah like you, if it's a chicago style game from that that bruins game where like we were getting blown out that that's not very good even if it's and, an L.A. game where, you know what, the Flames looked okay but didn't play a complete game, like I think you've got to play a complete game in that one. And, and I think even if the score doesn't reflect it, it's about did the Flames show up to play? Yeah. I, I and, think Boston could easily embarrass us even if we play well. I think the score on the scoreboard could embarrass the team. But I think you've got to show what you can do here. And we've built our confidence against lousy teams. You're not going to get a six nothing game against Boston, but even a two to one win, you know. Anything at this point, you yeah. Know, like if the Flames walk away with the win, that would be awesome. But yeah, I don't expect that. I'm going to split the week. I think they're going to lose to Boston. I think it'll be a competitive game, but I think they'll lose to Boston. And I think that they're going to beat Detroit because they seem to be beating the lousy teams lately. Yeah. Lousy teams on the road. Let's clarify. 
So that's my prediction is two points of the four, and that Detroit game kicks off a long road trip. It's a, a big Eastern trip except for Nashville that's uh, five games that doesn't end until the 1st of March. So if nothing else, though, Matt, I mean, if we're going to be giving up points to teams, I'd rather we give them up to Boston, Detroit, uh, Boston again, Tampa. Like, if we're going to give up points, let's give them up to – Eastern Conference teams and not to our divisional rivals. True. It's just they need the points regardless, so they can't really be sure. given up too many. But, I mean, for... even if you got to give a loser point to Boston or a loser point to Detroit, let's give the loser points in those games rather than on the 27th Nashville, against yeah. Nashville. Yeah, I agree. So, well, we'll talk to you next week after the trade deadline, and I'm – I'm hesitant, but I'm really hoping this team either stands pat or sells, like we said. But just on the back of my neck, I have a feeling we're going to have a big trade to talk about, and it might not be for the right reasons. Yeah. Like, uh, to me, like, there's one main reason why Canadian teams don't win the Stanley Cup and haven't since 93. And that's they do the short sighted thing because, oh, we get to the playoffs, the fans will be happy. And then they lose. Well, not in the just first the fans round, will be happy. We'll sell more beer. We'll sell more tickets. We'll make more money. Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, like I've been to enough playoff games where, like, okay, yeah, that's great. You know, the the two or three games at the end of the year, and then you go home for you know, and like to me, like those don't matter to to be honest like ooh we made the first round yay half the league does you know like i want to like, see them actually do something instead of like oh well we got the participation trophy it's like and making the playoffs in the CFL everybody makes it except for the really worst y- yeah like it, it's not something that you know separates you out it's not like baseball where if you make the playoffs it's a big deal just because like only five teams actually make it from each conference like it, you, in hockey, like half the league does. It's like, oh well, gee, we we not on the bottom half of the standings, yay. You know, like to me, like the Flames need to do what's right for with the end goal of winning the cup. And to me, like this team as it's built right now. They could fall backwards into it just because of the fact that the division's mediocre and all of that, but, you know, ifs and maybes won't get you there, and I think that this team needs to build a foundation that's proper in order to take that next step, and I just don't see this current group being what's needed. I think that Sacrifice they need to the do... present and a couple games maybe in the playoffs this year for the future and maybe you know four rounds of playoff games next year yeah well like you look at boston they retooled because they were kind of you know in this same zone back in 2015 and they did the unusual thing of selling off a couple of their bigger pieces but not vital core guys and lucic who was on the beginning of his downward spiral and dougie hamilton and they made the Stanley Cup Finals last year, and they're looking to be the favorite to win it this year, and they're the best team in the East this year. And, you know, like, yeah, it sucked for, like, a year or so a- after they did that, but the team has b- bounced back and is even better than they were when they were waffling, and the Flames are kind of in that waffling zone, and if they can cash in now and get a whole bunch of good young guys their drafting has been good if you make those picks you're gonna get a huge influx of good players and hopefully spring the team forward not necessarily next season but definitely the year after and moving forward well let's hope that's what happens do you want to take us out Matt? well as always for the long term go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.